Yeah, all right. I love that. I get to play it. I'm psyched. All right. If you didn't see it already, yes, uh, just uh, about an hour and a half ago, almost, uh, yeah, just about two hours ago now, um, I was able to go live on Rockfin, and we had a good core group of people who joined us. You can watch that if you're a Rock, Rockfin subscriber. And I went through some um, information that I wanted to discuss regarding the SVB collapse. I'm going to go through that again, and I've expanded it. I've actually got more information. And as I mentioned to those people who were watching, Rhonda was in there, and thank you again, Rhonda. Well, I think we had like five people live at a certain point. And we had some tech problems and things were getting crazy. So I wasn't able to go on at exactly four o'clock as I wanted to. I think I got on like 20 minutes after four. So if you stuck with us, that was really, really nice of you. Very kudos to you. Hats off. Public image hat off. Redacted hat off. I've got all my hats off. So thank you so much for doing that, everybody, for hanging out. But in order to give you value back and, and make sure that your, your time, I hope, is well spent here, um, you know, over the weekend, I pretty much spend almost all weekend just looking into stories and breaking things down and things like that. And then on Sundays, I pretty much write all day long, nonstop until I go to bed, almost nonstop, unless I get some food or I get in the shower or something like that. That's it. That's all I do. So yesterday, I mean, it's not that's all I do. Like, it's some bad thing. I make sure that is what I do because I want to make sure that the MRC TV team has a number of stories. So I wrote four stories yesterday, probably about, about 6,000 words or so. And I wrote one story about this SVB crash. And there was so much information coming in. As I was writing it, I had to have a cutoff point. Literally, after I wrote it, I found out about this other bank crash in New York. So then I went back to the editor, texted uh, the, to the director, Eric Shiner, texted him and said, hey, do you, do you want me to fold that into the story? He said, go for it, amigo. So then later during the night, I was adding material. That was all on the back end of MRC TV. That story is so big, it doesn't look like MRC TV has been able to publish that story yet. So what I did was I took it and the way that it works with MRC TV is I'm not an employee there. I'm on contract with them. And my contractual arrangement with MRC TV is such that I can do outside work for myself as long as and, and I, 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 I can I can't reproduce material that I did for MRC TV. That is contractually theirs once I give it to them. Uh, I, I, of course, later on, I can ask them if I can republish it later, that sort of thing. But in deference to them, it's supposed to be exclusive. But if it's substance, substantively different enough from the MRC TV presentation of what it will be, then it's OK. So what I did was I took this uh, piece on this SVB crash and I expanded it and I made it bigger for my Substack. And since the time that you and I got together at Rockfin, everybody, for the exclusive just a little while ago, about an hour ago, hour and 20, hour, almost two hours ago, like I said, um, I have posted it and created a Substack post out of it. So that is at Substack now. I've created a Substack post from that. You can find that linked at, of course, at my Substack if you get the emails directly. If you're a subscriber, it doesn't cost you anything. And um, if you are a paid subscriber, thank you very much. I, we're actually getting a few people who are paid subscribers now, which is really cool. I've got special things to send out to you. And also, if you are following me on Twitter uh, and on Gab, you'll see my announcements about that. OK, so we're going to get into it right now because there's some additional information that I want to provide to you. So I'm going to take myself off the screen a little bit here. I can actually fix the cam while I do that. And um here is the headline, SVB crash. This is one whopper of a headline for a whopper of a bank crash. Waterfall of asset liquidation preceded by bad Kramer advice. That should be with a C. Central bank inflation, sketchy bonuses, sell-offs, FDIC-backed moral hazard. So there's a little shot that was taken on Friday. And here is... The information now, as I mentioned uh, about about two hours ago, um, one of the things that I, uh, about which I'm sensitive is getting too reading like when I read something out loud. The other thing that I'll mention to you later comes when we're talking about the fight for 15 fiction. 
And I think it's kind of a neat thing to realize. And it's a really cool, solid way to start start expanding this because I, I'm I want to respond to your positive comments about the fiction. I don't know exactly how to handle it because I've gotten so many positive comments about the fiction that it's almost as if I should be starting a separate channel for live fiction readings. It's it's weird, but I'll go into that later. So as I read the nonfiction here, which is actually easier to read than fiction because you don't have to do multiple voices and remember which one's which and so on and so forth. That's one of the key things. Um, uh, don't let me over talk. One of the things that happens is you get adrenalized and you start to talk real fast. You put a lot into it. You know, you're the only one talking unless you're taking phone calls. So you get less. I, I, I get a sense that I'm less conversational. And sometimes I feel like in not being that conversational, it, it is less of a conversation. It's more of a, this is a news presentation and everything is intense. So let me go through it. And I, I get intense about stuff. I'm sure you probably do too. Um, but especially because you're so kind to watch on Rockfin, um, I want to give it back and forth feedback. So sometimes it's going to be more like me reading and presenting. And then other times I'm going to sort of kick back and be sound maybe a little weaker. And uh, maybe a little more conversation, not as powerful and intense. And that's the way it is. Walter Cronkite, you know, right. <laughs> like I said, Walter Cronkite was an avowed socialist, but he didn't mention it until after he retired. All right. Classy. That's a that's an honest journalist, isn't it? So here it is. I'm going to blow it up for you over at Substack. A waterfall or an avalanche? Take your pick. The Silicon Valley Bank collapse demands our attention. If likened to a waterfall, the Silicon Valley Bank collapse that dominates dominated U.S. news Friday and through the weekend was sourced from years of central bank inflation and risk inspiring federal policies that led to it that led to it to the crash. And it has seen bits of key information like detritus flowing into view behind it. So, all right. If it is an avalanche. The SVB crash has deep systemic central banking roots, possesses numerous policy triggers, and throws at us revelations about untrustworthy media, dangerous risk-increasing institutions like the FDIC, and what appears to be justified worry that even as one sees breaking news of New York-based Signature Bank collapsing, this could be just the start of many more collapses, more insane central government bailouts, even if they're not given that name, and a political push for central bank digital currency. Oh, now, come on. Come on, you guys. You were thinking that? Nah, that's just conspiracy thinking. Like they were targeted? Like, no, that's conspiracy. No, I honestly, I don't, I don't think they had to be targeted. Because everything is, the veneer is so flimsy for these banks. And they are so flipped now on their investments in bonds. There are a lot of banks that are in this trouble. So we'll continue. Amongst the news crashing around us, we easily can see the absurd character of CNBC investment financial expert Jim Cramer, who, as the New York Post notes, sang the praises of SVB stock in a manner that echoed his dumb 2008 suggestion to not dump Bear Stearns stock just days prior to its collapse. And oh, I forgot to put the hyperlink in there for that one. I mentioned that I was going to put that in live when I went two hours ago. But here you can see my hyperlink to the New York Post story about this. And I do want to mention to you, uh, you can play this video of Kramer talking about how wonderful SVB is, if you want to, there he is with all of their pop-ups. But Kramer, Kramer, what is this? Why do you always have to speak so rapidly? You've got a teleprompter. They can control the pace. What is it with you, Kramer? Yeah, Mr. Kramer is just difficult to listen to, listen to, to leave a preposition dangling. And he strings words together that at a certain point you say, nah, dude, I'm not going to bother. So anyway, you've probably seen the video. You know that he was singing the praises of SVB. And I'll show just a second of it, just, you know, for the color of it. And, you know, here it, here it is. By the way, are the best value, especially if you like to uh, imbibe. The ninth best performer, you 
data is SVB financial going on. This is back with the deposit base that Wall Street had mistakenly concerned about. SVB okay. He says Wall Street was mistakenly concerned about them. Okay. Mm -hmm. So anyway, just wanted to get him off of there. So, you know, who needs to see him anymore? So I said, then there's the off-tune presence of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, a.k.a. FDIC, a constitution-defying, risk-pumping legacy of FDR central planning and cronyism that not only promises your tax cash to each signatory bank up to $250,000 per depositor as so-called insurance. By the way, it was $150,000 before 2008, and it was $40,000 before, I think, 1980. Um, it is, as its own financial entity, already strapped. It has nowhere near the assets to cover all the $9 trillion in risk that it promises to insure. Last I saw, it had $125 billion in assets. And of course, who knows whether those are real assets, right? I mean, this bank, SVB, claimed that they had assets, and many of those assets were government bonds. But the prices, the valuation of those government bonds dropped precipitously as the Fed started to raise rates. And you'll see when we talk about the inverted uh, the inverted bond curve, the yield curve. So here it is. So yeah, so what they claim they have in assets, what any bank claims they have in assets right now is nowhere close to what are the real assets, whether it's real estate or it's government bonds or anything, unless they've got precious metals. Then you have kind of a good idea. Silver, it seems like they've been manipulating, well, both silver and gold, they've been manipulating a little bit, but you have a little better idea there. So I said, the SVB story is big, not just because it is the second biggest bank failure in U.S. history. This is tied to a darker history of U.S. central planning, of government control of the money system and government debt and the inflation boom bust cycle that they all inspire. So we've got central planning, government control of the money system, which, of course, is central planning and government debt caused by a bunch of central planners. And that inflationary boom bust cycle, of course, we're starting to see the bust. And I think that this is a prime example of how the unconstitutional rules and so-called protections that politicians claim are for all of us, right, you guys, really are just weapons for them to use selectively as they work on more ways to accumulate power for themselves and shovel assets to those who play their political game. First, a bit of backstory. So in 2004, I wrote a piece for the Mises Institute. I'll show it to you here. It's called The Deflation Dog Didn't Bite After All. And I tried to warn people back then, May 4th, 2004, I was sounding the alarm. You can, it's just, you can get pretty frustrated. It, it just is a frustrating thing. So anyway, I said, uh, in which I tried to warn people that the government prohibition of a competitive money system and the simultaneous existence of a government-granted monopoly, Federal Reserve, actually, of course, it holds a fraction of metal commodities in so-called reserve compared to the money that it prints, was not just immoral and anti-economic, it was, at that time, keeping interest rates near zero and making the coming inflationary tragedy even worse. The subsequent bust wiped out trillions in overpriced investments and saw so many g months of GDP lower than the level measured at the end of 2007 that technically it was an economic depression that lasted until the end of 2011. And of course, as you and I know, everybody, they did not, the, the powers that be in media at MSNBC and CNN and CNBC, they didn't want to use the word depression because Obama was in office. They didn't want to do it. I've seen one economist recently, and he was a left-wing economist, admit to that. But you wouldn't see Paul Krugman. They, it was all the economic downturn. And that was the time when Paul Krugman even said, well, I think that, um, you know, I, I think it, it, this economic downturn would really turn around if, if, if you just had, for example, uh, an alien invasion. You wouldn't even have to have an alien invasion. You could just have the, the threat of an alien invasion. That would inspire all sorts of investment and spending into defending against the aliens, which is exactly the kind of 
mono mind stupidity that gets people claiming that the United States got out of the Great Depression through World War II. In other words, shifting all those human and natural resources and money into things like tanks rather than into things that actually help people's lives in their homes. Shifting things into bullets to kill other people and bombs. That helped the economy. No, it got people working on a bunch of things that ended up being spent and used elsewhere. Now, people can say, well, it was for defense or whatever, but really substantively, as far as increasing people's living standards, it was as dumb as having people dig ditches and then refill them, which is the kind of thing that the um, that the uh, uh, Worker, Workers Progress Association, the WPA and the AAA did for workers and for agricultural people. Right. The Agricultural Adjustment Act, where they ended up paying to slaughter pigs and overturn uh, crops. Crazy. I mean, and they were doing it at the same time that Stalin actually sort of laid off a little bit. In the meantime, later, of course, when he reinstituted even more problems and slaughtered even more millions of people, he blamed the starvation on World War II as they're going to be blaming Russia for all our problems, right? So, as I mentioned here, it was a depression. Government spending and borrowing, I wrote, central bank inflation, i.e. money pumping, in order to buy that government debt, and fascist cronyism lead not just to the disaster of price increases and overbidding of resources, but to time shifts for spending. Now, what do we mean by that, right? Well, everybody has a time preference in economics. Sorry, let me do that again. So now I'm on screen. Everybody has a time preference for economics. This is just great. Anyway, everybody has a time preference for economics. So if you know that holding on to your money will give you a better payoff later on as productivity increases, that's good. In fact, in a normal market, there's a really good uh, pamphlet from the uh, Institute for Economic Affairs over in London on Lord North Street. That's the first place I went when I uh, arrived in London, actually. I went there in the morning um, right off the train. I was carrying my bag out of uh, Heathrow. But it's called, I believe it's called Less Than Zero. And um, it's all about how in a productive economy with stable money, with a competitive money system, productivity gains actually lead to naturally decreasing prices. And that's not deflation. That's just productivity leading to lower prices. That's a good thing. Deflation is when the central bankers who control the money artificially decrease the money supply beyond what the normal money supply should be, rather than inflating the money supply beyond what the money supply should be. So it causes all sorts of problems. In that case, it causes economic downturn because people can't get the money to invest and things like that and they have a hard time, as they would have a hard time with inflation. But at that point, you get people who are not recognizing the fact that the Fed is involved there because everybody thinks the Fed is supposed to be involved. It's just amazing. They can never hit it right. They'll never hit it right. So as I mentioned here, these time shifts. So for example, if you knew, if somebody knew that, um, their money is going to be worth less. Well, you know naturally what they're going to do. They're going to spend more quickly, which is what they do in a hyperinflation situation. They'll go out and try to get their money in the morning because they know that by the time they spend it in the afternoon, they're not going to be able to get half of what they could have gotten for it in the morning. It just becomes ridiculous. So you saw why Weimar Germany and stuff. And it's just that's one of the reasons why uh, F. Paul Wilson's story, Arians and Absinthe, is, is so fantastic. Got to get a drink of water here. So because in Arians and Absinthe, uh, as I mentioned uh, previously on a program, uh, Paul uses, rather than chapter breaks, he uses the, um, the monetary difference between the German mark and the dollar. And he keeps putting that in there, showing how the mark is becoming worthless. So I'm going to grab this water real quick. All right. So continue here. And we roll. So, yeah, it, they they change their behavior and people will start to shift their spending and they'll spend more rapidly. And also, as they start to recognize the, the problem, 
And then they'll also misallocate resources, including human resources and time. And of course, the inevitable busts arrive once the average consumer begins to see how intensely his or her buying power has been diluted by the vast amount of added money in the system. I said at a certain point, the detached from real economics minds at the Federal Reserve begin to raise interest rates, which often, as it has done now, leads to an inverted yield curve where short-term bond rates actually are higher than the 10-year bond, where prices for those now lower bond yields actually crash. And both factors not only slam new participation in investment, they make it dif- in long-term investment, they make it difficult for fractional reserve banks, such as SVB, to get liquidity needed the liquidity needed to pay depositors demands for its already lacking barely available fractional reserves as i noted once depositors get a sense of the problem well you know what happens they know they have to get what they can out of the bank before another customer beats them to it economist peter c earl has composed for the american institute for economic research an excellent overview of the svb crash one that offers wider lessons for all people interested in fundamental economics. In part, he explains, quote, Federal Depository Insurance Company, FDIC Holdings, indicate that U.S. banks took over $600 billion worth of unrealized losses last year. And this is key, again, a large portion of which was generated by precipitously falling bond prices. Time preference, right? People are switching to short-term time preference because the Fed raised rates, which means that the U.S. government has to raise interest on their bonds and people are going to be attracted to the short-term rather than the long-term bonds. Why? Because they know that rates are going to keep going up and the dollar is going to be worthless. They want the money back more quickly. That's why in 2008-2009, China, Russia, and other countries dropped They stopped buying, I should say, long-term bonds from the U.S. government. And that was one of the things that triggered the United States pushing away Russia, alienating Russia, and trying to isolate Russian energy exports. The Fed's aggressive interest rate. uh, So, yes, um, a large portion of which was generated by precipitously falling bond prices, writes uh, Professor Earle, amid the Fed's aggressive interest rate hikes. In addition to holding $108 billion in treasuries during the worst year in history for such securities, SVB's books include $74 billion in loans, a portion of which were undoubtedly extended to local tech companies. Tech companies have recently been under pressure as well and are cutting costs, end quote. All right. Earl's mention of the FDIC offers us a key opportunity to more closely scrutinize that government creation, the FDIC, and to look at the overall idea of government so-called insurance for deposits as well. Not only is there no constitutional provision allowing the federal government to create a so-called corporation, let alone one that promises to insure bank deposits, the mere existence of the FDIC is what economists call a moral hazard. It promises insurance for deposits which inspires bankers to engage in riskier lending and investment compared to any environment in which they would have to get insurance via real market-based non-tax-backed means. The FDIC and its cousin, the FSLIC, that's the Federal Savings and Loan Insurance Corporation, already has and have inspired reckless spending. In 1980, the FDIC increased from $40,000 to $100,000 per deposit per customer, the amount it would insure for individuals and businesses. Then, in 1989, the $20 billion in the red FSLIC, Federal Savings and Loan Insurance Corporation, was folded into the FDIC, and the result was a disaster, inspiring even more reckless lending, rampant and uneconomic home building, and an eventual bubble burst in the housing sector circa 1990. And I said, just out of college, I actually worked for an auction firm that helped liquidate many of those homes through to 1991. 
So I saw it. I saw what people were dealing with, and it was not good. And the prices on some of these things, they went for a third of what they originally had been priced. That's why, as I mentioned on Friday, that's why Wizard of Oz, the end of Wizard of Oz is so key. When the wizard says, ah, oh, you liquidated her, eh? Very resourceful. Right there. Double whammy, liquidation and resources. You got to liquidate those resources, get them down from where they were bid up by this ridiculous amount of money that's been pumped into the system. So I said it inspired even more reckless and so on. And I worked for the auction hall company in 1991. But the FDIC is not just a moral hazard inspiring lending that normally would be avoided by real market participants. In the case of SVB, which partly thanks to this artificial insurance, was investing in worthless ESG, and here is their own website telling us about it and how proud they are about it. There it is, Silicon Valley Bank. I, I contemplated, I wondered in the live stream about two, two plus hours ago, if this website is going to be scratched very soon. But you can see on August of 2022, out of Santa Clara, California, SVB sang its own praises. The financial partner of the innovation economy and parent of Silicon Valley Bank today released its 2022 Environmental, Social, and Governance Report. The report details the company's commitments and strategies to help create a more just, equitable, and sustainable world and reports on its programs and progress made through 2021. Now, uh, for those who follow my work at MRC TV, you probably saw that I've done a piece already about how many state attorneys general were suing banks because, and actually they were trying to prevent um, uh, municipal, yes, that's what it, so they were, they were, they wanted to prevent banks from investing in ESG, but the key thing was that they were suing to try to prevent the um, municipal employee representatives and various governments within states. Like, for example, the comptroller of New York um, pressured the uh, International Organization for Standards for these codes for guns. Uh, they pressured the credit card companies to accept those codes. Luckily, as David Knight mentioned, uh, and as I reported, you'll see my report at MRC TV. In fact, I'll show you, it's right here. Um, here it is. Major credit cards are rethinking tracking gun purchases. Just as an aside, that was all tied into the ESG type stuff. And uh, the International Organization for Standard Standardization is a bunch of bureaucrats from a lot of different countries. It's based in Geneva, and it started in 1947, and it applies purchase codes for all sorts of things. For the longest time, they had no gun shop purchase codes, but back in September, they created them. And then I found out that this uh, comptroller for New York City, Brad Lerner is his name, uh, who's a very anti-gun guy, he lobbied the credit card companies, MasterCard, Visa, American Express, and Discover to accept those codes. Well, it turns out that because so many state attorneys general are trying to stop this, and they're, they're possibly going to go into court against these banks for doing this, um, they are also applying inside states various ways to try to prevent this from being done. There uh, numerous legislators are pr uh, proposing statutes to prevent this, that it's causing such confusion for the credit card companies that they're not going to engage in it. I'll read you that story a little bit later. The company Discover Card was ready to start. They, they had spoken, and I wrote a piece about this a week and a half ago, that they were going to be the first. However, they too are backtracking. So right now, all the major credit card companies either have said they're not going to do it or they said we started to do it and now we're pulling away the Discover card people. And they're mostly saying they're going to wait or not do it because there would be such confusion in their standardization from state to state that they don't want to be bothered with it. I don't know whether you think that that's a real excuse. I think they think they're going to be sued. Um, but anyway... And I don't see how a lawsuit could really stop them from collecting those codes because it's just part of the part of the uh, transaction. 
I do see how a lawsuit could stop them from sharing that information with government unless government has a warrant. So that's interesting. We'll see about that. You know, the question to me is, is the purchase the is the record of the purchase solely belonging to the gun shop and the individual buying the gun? Or does the credit card company also have the prerogative to share any of its data with the feds that it wants to share? Interesting question. But anyway, that aside, going back to the ESG stuff, you can see how this bank was involved with it. And of course, that has nothing to do with any fiduciary responsibility. That's something that uh, even in Congress, they're trying to stop ESG investment because it has nothing to do with what is required under the federal government rules, the laws, I should say, the statutes. They're not laws and they're not rules. Um, under Federal Trade Commission statutes and regulations and threats that say you have to have a fiduciary responsibility to your clients. So if it's ESG, there's, there's actually no way to be able to measure what the environmental value is of something. And they're actually, uh, the Federal Reserve approached six of the major banks in the United States last year to have them, and I know I'm sort of going on here, they wanted to have them come up with their own arbitrary numbers on what the costs would be for carbon and the environmental problems of using petrochemicals. So they're just gonna invent it, like they would invent it for the um, climate credit score stuff that the regional greenhouse gas initiative states, there are nine of them, have been involved in. Then we can talk about the RGGI thing later. It's mostly Northeastern states along the Eastern seaboard, New Hampshire, Maine, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, going down towards Virginia. I don't know if Virginia is involved, but uh, yeah, Delaware, all that. It's just ridiculous. Maryland, uh, New Jersey. Um, so uh, Jesse Pound writes this for CNBC, everybody. Check it out. According to press releases from regulators, the California Department of Financial Protection and Innovation closed SVB and named the FDIC as the receiver. Now, this is where we started getting into this on Friday, because when I read this that afternoon as I was doing show prep, I thought this doesn't make any sense. And then, it, of course, it did make sense. The FDIC, in turn, has created the Deposit Insurance National Bank of Santa Clara, which now holds the insured deposits of SVB. Interesting. So, as I'm, you'll see in my story, the FDIC said in the announcement that insured depositors will have access to their deposits no later than Monday. This was the report that came out Friday. SVB's branch offices will also reopen at that time under the control of the regulator. And I said, notice the term regulator. As I often stress to economic students, that's a euphemism for threatener or economic fascist. It not only is the immoral near end of a government-inspired economic boom-bust cycle, seeing specially selected people take over assets, seeing the government so-called manage who will and will not get paid and what they are owed as depositors or bondholders of the bank. It also indicates something else that's very important. Key figures in government knew what was going on. This special new deposit insurance bank of Santa Clara couldn't pop out of the statist oven in a day on March 10th. Bureaucrats and politicians, likely including California Governor Gavin Newsom, had to set it up and they had to approach people to become its new officers, this Deposit Insurance National Bank of Santa Clara. It's not like they're going to go out on the sidewalk. Hey, you want to come work for us? We just open up the doors. We got to do this fast, you guys. It's just happening right now. No way. They had foreknowledge of this. This tells us that the faceless figures who created the new bank had to have known about SVB's insolvency. This is worse than Jim Cramer applauding the bank mere days before the collapse. This is worse than Forbes recently placing it on its list of so-called best 
It's also worse than what we see in reports that Greg Becker, CEO of the bank, sold large holdings in it prior to the crash. And it's worse than the bank officials giving big bonuses to select employees prior to the crash. This indicates that officials worked behind the scenes not only to replace the soon-to-be-insolvent SVB, but that they didn't warn depositors about the financial instability of the institution. So we have all the links here. We have the Forbes link. If you want to check that out, that's available. Days after being found, uh, proud to be on Forbes uh, Best Banks list, Silicon Valley Bank shuts down. That's from uh, OP India. Uh, this Greg Becker story from Forbes sold $3.6 million in stock just before the collapse. And this one about the bonuses here, you can find this from CNBC. So we'll continue, however. We'll talk about the fact that they had to have known. And this is where we start to implicate the FDIC, and we start to implicate, implicate the Dodd-Frank legislation from uh, over a decade ago, and we start to implicate Liz Warren. And this is where I've added new information that I just discovered between the time I finished that live show about two, uh, two plus hours ago and when I started at six o'clock, I found out even more information about Liz Warren. So I said, this lack of transparency is precisely what politicians like Democrat Congressman Chris Dodd and Barney Frank told us they were so-called, I should say, stopping, insuring against when more than a decade ago, they passed constitution-defying legislation to have the Federal Reserve do annual so-called stress tests on large banks. Now, something I, I want to bring up, whether someone thinks that this is efficacious is a completely separate matter and not a consideration for anybody dealing with ethics, morals, or the U.S. Constitution. Let's say, hypothetically, there was something in the Constitution that allowed for this. Let's say that the Interstate Commerce Clause wasn't being misread, okay? And let's say that by signing up to be corporations, the people who sign up to be corporations for investments or banks or whatever, that they are openly, overtly accepting the idea that the government can tell them to do anything. Let's, let's put those on the table as givens, even though they're not really givens. But for the sake of argument, let's do that hypothetically. All right. Even if you could do that, morally, the only way you can police this check on the banks, the only way that you can provide the funds to file the paperwork to give these people their corporate status the only way that you can have that entire policing system and corporate benefit system is by taking money from other people to fund the government edifice that's, that services all of that. That comes up with the political ideas to do it, that opens up the offices for the people to file, that then funds all of the people who are going to be investigators and checking on the stress tests and all of it. Any of those requirements, even if people thought they were laudable, and beneficial, efficacious, and anything like that, including constitutional, even if all of those were thumbs up green check marks, it would still require people to have to pay into that system. It would force people to do it because it is run by the polis. It's not voluntary. Now, you could have a completely different system where, hypothetically, let's take the idea of a mall, right? You, let's say you have a, a or yeah, let's say you have a, an antiques, an antiques co-op, right? Now you take that physical idea of the antiques co-op where people go in, they agree to sell their stuff there. And there's someone who owns that place and says, okay, you come here, you agree to certain standards. You know, you keep your stuff clean. You don't put up, you know, pornographic stuff or whatever, or maybe it's uh, oh, this is all American colonial stuff from this era, but somebody starts bringing something different in. That is contrary to the agreement for all those people, right? So that would mean that by contract, they would also likely have some sort of enforcement mechanism, right? You're not going to have a, a, a contract that says, well, you can come here if you do this and this, 
but not if you do this and this. If you don't also in the contract provide, if you do do this and this, we can call an X, Y, or Z security firm to remove you. And you are agreeing to this if you're participating with us. It's just like if you're in a poker game or whatever. You're signing up whether it's explicit or it's assumed that people are going to treat each other a certain way. That's not the way the government is. The government doesn't give you the choice. It takes from you as it promises other people it's going to use your money for their benefit to create the corporations, to create the protection against the corporations, to create all the people who are going to draw six-figure salaries as economists and people who are in the financial sector working with the Federal Reserve and all these other people that are given license by the government. The only way those licenses, so-called, those permission slips and the okay are given is through extortion and threats by backed by government guns which is one of the major reasons why, as I mentioned, I got ripped off twice by uh, one particular, by employees at one particular TV show out in California. And I didn't bring suit for copyright inf infringement because I would be using the government court system, even though I was getting ripped off by people. I mean, literally, I'm watching words I wrote that came that were in my head being spoken by actors on a TV screen sitting on the bed where I used to sit, I used to sleep when I was a kid and I'm watching this from a, a show. And I know they, you know, those words were in my mind and now other people are saying them, but I didn't bring suit because I didn't want to force somebody else to pay for the court system for me to retrieve what, what I thought deservedly was mine. I, that's why I don't support government, government, um, policed copyright protection. I believe it should be done privately, just like in that antique co-op. So here, if you've got a banking system with a real free market bank system, you would automatically have incentives for anybody who wanted to participate with X, Y, or Z free banking banks. They would say, well, what do you have for checks? Are you transparent? What kind of reserves do you have? How are you invested? And people would want to know there would be private businesses that would get involved a lot better than Jim Cramer in opening the books on these banks and the banks that wouldn't want to open their books. Who would want to deal with them? Right. It's like if you go to Tony Arterburn, right, Wise Wolf Gold and Silver Exchange. If you're really interested, Tony will show you the whole way that he checks out the quality of his coins and the metals and the assays, all that stuff. He'll, he he and Kenzie would show you, okay, this is how we look into this stuff. Now, if you had somebody else down the street who's not willing to do that, where would you prefer to go? It's the same thing with the banks, of course. So I don't mean I don't need to or mean or need to belabor it, but very clearly there is a stark difference between not only the outcome that you're going to get in a free market system where people are checking their own interests and they can decide how much do I want to spend investigating this this business. And as people see crashes, they start to learn, ah, maybe I'll check it out a little bit more. Sort of like going to a restaurant. Ah, you know, I know five people who got food poisoning from that restaurant over the course of six months. They didn't even clean up their act. I don't think I'm going to go there, right? You don't need the Government Protection Bureau for anything because not only is it inefficient and doesn't answer to the level that you might want versus what somebody else's want and wants, it's one size fits all. It's also often very corrupt. As I mentioned, in Massachusetts, they had restaurant inspectors and a study from the Boston Herald, some, a reporter investigated and found they only had two and a half restaurant inspectors operating in the entire state. I don't know. I don't even know how many restaurants there must be. I mean, how many hundreds are there, right? They only had two and a half restaurant inspectors operating for the whole state. And then they found out that one of them was on the take or two of them, two of them were on the take. So there was only, it was basically like 1.5, depending upon like, I don't know whether, how, how it worked. Like one person was like part-time or something. It was 2.5 and then it dropped to 1.5 because I think two of them were on the take. And now, I think that was from like 2006 or something like that, that that came out. Uh, I think I, I might even have that uh, linked um, in my, in or I might have it indexed in my book in Live Free or Die in my essay called Beautiful Chaos. I think it might be in there. So anyway, 
Uh, just to get back to this story, I, I and I appreciate it if you guys think that the divergences are interesting. Um, Elizabeth Warren is in the news here, and so are Dodd and Frank. So as I mentioned, curiously, Dodd Frank also ushered in the obnoxious Elizabeth Warren creation of the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, CFPB, which said nothing about this coming collapse and sees, I should say that differently, which said nothing about this coming collapse and sees both it and Liz Warren mum about the FDIC figures behind the scenes who conspired to create a new bank out of the collapsing SVB while not telling depositors. That was the key. That was what Dodd-Frank was about. That's what her bureau is about. It's about opaqueness and clarity. And in all these instances, the FDIC was not clear. They were not transparent. And I said, and by the way, Barney Frank in 2015 joined the board of Signature Bank, the New York State-based bank that just failed over the weekend. And there, oh, look. Well, isn't that interesting? Page isn't found. Well, I'll, I'll go find another, another link for you. It's out there. Let's see if that pops up. Maybe it's a bad link. The New York State-based bank that just failed over the weekend. And as I mentioned, he earned uh, $150,000 last year from being on the board, and he has a bunch of stock with them as well. Some commentators on the left-leaning side of U.S. politics, and this is the new stuff that I got just over the past couple hours, argue that Donald Trump moved to exempt from the Federal Reserve stress tests banks with $100 billion or lower in assets, which would include SVB. But the wider net of Federal Reserve stress tests for larger banks that might have money involved with SVB and the CFPB itself indicate to us that neither the Fed nor the CFPB prevented what the Dodd-Frank bill promised it would stop. And again, the FDIC had to have been working for at least a couple weeks to form this new corporation that would take over SVB. Why is it that Elizabeth Warren's wonderful creation, the CFPB, was not made aware by the FDC while it wasn't telling anyone that SVB was insolvent. Why are the rules that it applies, that CFPB applies to private businesses, and that Dodd-Frank, at least in spirit, tries to tell us that it applies, why are they not applied when the FDIC clearly is working with government figures on the federal and the state level to create a new bank out of an insolvent bank? Why aren't they warning depositors? This is exactly, exactly the type of spirit of the little guy that Elizabeth Warren tries to defend. I said, are Americans not supposed to notice these towering edifices of graft, fascism, empty promises, and utter hypocrisy? As we see politicians like conservative Congress Congressman Matt Getz openly oppose any bailout for SVB, and there it is, as he openly opposes it, and we realize that the unbalanced and unconstitutional FDIC itself likely will get a bunch more of our cash. Again, they have $125 billion in assets, and they're trying to cover $9 trillion of risk. This entire house of cards is ready to fall, and the special people, well, they need our money, I write. And as Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, the Federal Reserve, and the FDIC scheme for a way to hand out more bailout-like money without calling it a bailout, likely handing big money to big depositors who should have known that the $250,000 maximum insurance from the FDIC wouldn't cover larger deposits, we will watch as the central planners try to make decisions about our lives and liberty. Is it any wonder that some of us don't like pretending that America is the so-called land of the free? 
So that was intense. I got to go over to Rockfin. I'm, I'm counting on you all. Thanks for hanging out, everybody. Rhonda's there. John, Anarchy Andrew. Anarchy, hey, by the way, I saw that you tried to email. I've just been super busy and I was kind of sick too. So sorry about that. Rhonda's there. Anarchy Andrew, little John. Thanks for hanging out, y'all. Great to see you. Hello, little John. Hello to you. And if you're just watching us on Twitter, uh, please join us in the Rockfin chat. That is a very, very cool thing to do because, of course, all the cool people rock. They rock at Rockfin. So I hope you found that interesting and uh, and worthwhile. Again, if you want to go over to my Substack, I mean, how many times a day do you say, well, just head to my Substack, head to this, head to that, watch this link, watch this link. And things go by so quickly. And that's one of the reasons why I have been contemplating opening up more to live readings of fiction and nonfiction. Um, the fiction would be fairly short, maybe, you know, about a half hour total, 20 minutes each time, something like that. And the nonfiction would be either uh, articles, solo, or what I would really like to do is do continuing pieces, multiple pieces of larger um, larger uh, items, one of which I'm going to open up tonight, which I think you're going to really like. I just got this new book on Ukraine and I want to, I'm, I'm literally, I'm going to read it for the first time with you and comment as I read to see whether or not I think what I'm reading jives with the information I already know. And I'm sure I'm going to get some more information, but you know, if I think it's skewed, if I think it's swayed, I'll, I'll bring it up. And uh, maybe the next day I'll take more time to say, OK, remember when we read this? This is where this goes wrong. And I think one of the um, one of the things that I really appreciate about a, about James Corbett and I know with an with a relationship with information online, it's very easy. You look at it and stuff flows by very quickly in the news cycle. That's one of the reasons why I watch shows. Typically, I watch them more than once. Um for example, when I was just out of college, I used to bring a notebook in front of me and I would sit in front of the news, the nightly news and take notes. And then I would get out human events and compare what I got from that to human events. And then I'd go in to look at books and stuff like that. I have notebooks filled with stuff like that. And um, so I, I, I have this desire, I have this need to solidly lock in information that I can utilize. Like I often mention intellectual ammunition that you can take with you that you can use and that I'm not just passing by somebody in conversation and say, oh, well, you know, uh, there's this or that. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, when I ran for Senate for the Libertarian Party, I wouldn't have taken the office, but I ran just so I could get into debates. And a woman invited me to go to a, a high school up in Concord, New Hampshire, the capital of the state, and speak. It was like a candidate's forum thing. And they had candidates for a lot of different things like aldermen and stuff like that. There was nobody there who was running for U.S. Senate. I was running against Gene Shaheen, the Democrat, and Scott Brown, the Republican rhino, who had basically carpet bagged and moved to New Hampshire. Um, and by the way, uh, those of you who are familiar with the song, The Girl with the Curious Hand by Digny Fignes, um, that was a Boston-based uh, guy uh, she is the model in the video, The Girl with the Curious Hand, um, Scott Brown's wife. So, yeah, I don't know what her first name is. Is it Elizabeth or something? I don't know. But anyway, yeah, she's the woman in the, I think she's in like a bathing suit down by the water or something like that. And it's a good song. It's a good tune. But anyway, um, Digny Fignus. I wonder if that's his real name. And, and by the way, Digny Fignus came out with his song a couple years after Fad Gadget came out with his song. So it was all these weird names, you know, and then later it was like Depeche Mode getting like, I don't want to get French. I like the Digny Fignus. It sounds it sounds Irish or something. I don't know. And then you had uh, um, Fad Gadget. I was like, what the heck is that? But anyway, um, so I, I like what I want to do when I do these readings is I want to provide links and allow people to take this information and you get so much information thrown at you. But if you want to use it as like a study course, if you want to take the information and utilize it, if you want to be able to share it with others solidly, what, what ended up happening was when I was invited up to Concord, um, I was there and all these 
candidates were talking about climate change and just fear mongering. And it was all this general nonsense. And I said, OK, well, and I gave them specific information, the students who were up in the, uh, you know, it was like their auditorium thing. And I said, listen, if you want to look up this book, check out this book, Unstoppable Global Warming Every 1500 Years. If you want to go to this website, here's a, a pretty good website for resources so that you'll see stuff that maybe you aren't seeing if you're just looking at CNN. Uh, take a look at the graph from Al Gore. Do a zoom in on it. Get that book out of the library that they made out of his Inconvenient Truth. Look at it in a, in a magnifying glass. Look at that graph. See, look up Cli Climate Gate 1 and 2. Um, look up the University of East Anglia. Look up, and I said, just you know, write this stuff down. Take these terms. Check it out for yourself. All right. See what you think. Right. So I had this knowledge on hand because I was so well versed with it. I was using it all the time. At the end of that, as it was all over, oh, when I finished, it was really cool. The kids actually gave me a standing ovation because I treated them honestly, like I gave them respect. I didn't just spout stuff off because I was I had this spot in front of them and I could just say what I wanted to say, and make myself feel good. I wanted to do them a service. So why why should I be there? I'd be just wasting their time. Like, you know, I could just be, you know, singing in the shower or something like that. It was just ridiculous. So these people, the, a bunch of these other candidates, not all of them, but a lot of them, the exits were up the stairs. And so you had to like walk past all the seats. The kids were gone. And I walked up up the stairs. They they made like a semicircle around me in front of the doors and basically blocked my exit. And they're like, oh, you you uh, you bad mouth Jean Shaheen. I'm like, yeah, I'm running against Jean Shaheen. And she has openly lied to me. And uh, they're like, well, and I, I gave them the example. I was like, you can ask the reporters in the room. They were right there. I'll give you the names. And they said, well, you're, you denied climate change. I'm like, yeah, that's right. What did you offer the students? What did you give them? What solid information did you give them that might give them some satisfaction into looking something up that would be interesting? Nothing. I was like, have a great day, everybody. And then they broke apart. And I exited Egypt. <laughs> Pharaoh let me leave. Be gone with you. Even though I'm not Jewish, I felt like one of the Israelites. So there you go. Thank you.